Hello and welcome to Tata Literature Live 2021, the Mumbai International Lit Fest, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects and powered by Godrage. Towards the end of the session, we will be taking time to answer some questions from the audience. So please do leave your questions in the comment section. Sonia Falero is a noted writer of narrative nonfiction. Her latest book in this genre, The Good Girls and Ordinary Killing, was published in 2021. She also writes for leading international newspapers, journals, and literary magazines. She is the co-founder of DECA, a journalist cooperative, and the founder of South Asia Speaks, a literary mentorship program. And joining her, we have Sumanna Ramanan, an independent journalist whose work has appeared in leading publications. She has been an editor with Economic and Political Weekly, Hindustan Times, and Scroll.in. She is working on her first book, a work of narrative nonfiction. Let's begin the literary literature of reality. Sonia and Sumana, the floor is yours. Hi, Sonia. Lovely hey. to meet you. Thank you so much for doing this. Yes, it's my pleasure. Uh, a warm welcome to everyone who's watching. Um, so we are going to be talking about Sonia's latest book, The Good Girls, An Ordinary Killing. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, example of narrative nonfiction, uh, which was a genre that was pioneered in the um, 1960s in the US. Uh, the article that really uh, blazed the trail was um, called The Loser, a profile of a boxer by Gay Talese. And uh, Gay Talese's colleague, Tom Wolf, publicly declared that this article had set a completely different path for nonfiction and journalism. And Tom Wolf called it the new journalism. So these are all interchangeable words. Um, and The Good Girls does a lot of what narrative nonfiction sets out to do, which Gay Talese, according to Gay Talese, Literary nonfiction brings the reader into close proximity to real people and places through the use of accurately reported dialogue, scene setting, intimate personal details, including the use of interior monologue and other techniques that have long been associated with fiction writers and playwrights. So like I said, The Good Girls does a lot of this, so I'm really excited to be talking to Sonia about how she did it. But before we get started, to sort of bring uh, viewers up to speed on the events that form the core of the book, I just like her to speak a little bit about the title and the subtitle. So who are the good girls? Why do you say they are good? And what is the ordinary killing? And why is it ordinary? The good girls are the two children who are at the center of the story. I call them Padma and Lali because under Indian law, I can't name them. Padma was the older child. She was 16 years old, Padma Shakya. Uh, her, um, uh, her, her first cousin was uh, Lali. And they lived in the same joint family in a village called Katra Sadat Ganj in Uttar Pradesh. And uh, I call them the good girls because that was the expectation that their family had from them. That was the expectation that society had from them. But that is also who they were. They were good kids. Um, I do think, though, that my my name for the book really is, is more of a critique of what was expected of them uh, as girls and as women. And uh, the, the 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 subtitle of an ordinary killing was actually it came from my publisher here at Bloomsbury um, UK because uh, she pointed out that you know although this the the death of the girls was so horrific and so deeply sad um, really having shaken the village and and I think the country at large it was still one of so many violent things that happen to girls and women in India, but also all over the world. You know, violence against women is is still one of those things that is you would think is acceptable because of how frequent it is uh, and how it keeps recurring. And so there was in that sense, seen through that lens, an almost like an ordinariness 
to the fact that girls were not allowed to complete the natural course of their lives and that they were killed. Right. So basically, these girls went missing in 2014 and uh, very soon after were found, uh, their bodies were found hanging from a tree in, the, in an orchard in their village. So I just want to, uh, you know, uh, the, the spine of the book is really uh, the story about this tragedy and its aftermath and the investigation. And you sort of um, structured it like a thriller. And, uh, you know, I thought I was following the book, fairly, uh, the, the case fairly closely, but even I was surprised by the ending. And, uh, of course, uh, like a hardcore a crime fiction fan might have spotted some of the clues you planted. So it was kind of a quite impressive uh, recreation of that genre. So when did you actually think of uh, writing it in this, uh, in this thriller mode? So I'm really, really interested in narrative structure. Even my previous book of nonfiction, Beautiful Thing, Inside the Secret World of Bombay's Dance Bars, is a very carefully constructed book. It gives you the sense that it was written in, in, in a few hours, maybe like a few nights, uh, because of the pacing of the book and because of the, uh, you know, the, um, because of how it is constructed. But that's something that actually took years to do. And the reason that narrative construction is so important for a writer like me who writes about subjects um, that, that, that people don't normally want to talk about or, or normally want to read about, you know, for example, gender or violence or in this, in the case of the good girls, caste, uh, police politics. These are not subjects that you think you, you're going to be drawn to uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, you think, well, what do I need to learn? I know everything there is. So how do you support the reader or encourage the reader in, 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 in reading the book? And you do that by thinking about a narrative that would be compelling to them while also staying completely true to the facts. And it so happened that with both Beautiful Thing and The Good Girls, <clears throat> it, it wasn't, in, on one hand, it wasn't hard because this is how these terrible stories played out. But on the other hand, it is constructing this sort of, um, you know, house of cards is very, very, very difficult, just because of the enormous quantity of material that you're dealing with. And the real skill then becomes, what do I include? What do I leave out? Um, and, and that's how you build things so that the purpose isn't, it isn't a, a genre in so much as how do I, how do I convince you that this is an important and an urgent story? What method do I use to do to do that? Yes, and yes, and it, and you've uh, done a great job of that. But of course, uh, I mean, I would be doing injustice to viewers if I just said, you know, it's structured like a thriller because this it's so much more. It's very layered, and um, it's a book in which society is as much a character you know, caste, patriarchy, and as you say in your author's uh, note that this is as much about women in modern India, it's a also it's also about what it means to be poor. But the way you kind of bring in uh, these social details, you sort of bring it alive. And what I'd like to do for viewers is to have you read uh, a very small passage, uh, which sort of illustrates uh, how you kind of accumulate these fine details over the book to kind of give us a very rich uh, uh, view into what life is like in these villages and what the people are like. Sure. So this is the this is that chapter called uh, of on page thirty two. It says uh, this is just uh, the morning before the girls disappear. The fair comes to the village. Yeah. Yeah. That morning, 27 May, it was just the girls in the house with the two mothers. Padma was frying slices of bottle gourd in a seasoning of salt and chili powder. Over the wall, Sia Devi and Lali made sure the buffaloes were fed, the courtyard was swept, and an afternoon meal of curry and rotis prepared over the smoky outdoor fire. Sia Devi reminded her daughters to keep the food covered. These brazen monkeys will steal every last roti if they can. Given half a chance, they will run off with the ateka dabba. 
When Lely picked up her sharp tongue sickle to lend family members a hand with the harvest, Padma insisted on tagging along. Cousin Manju had succumbed to the heat and was asleep on a charcoal. In the fields, the perspiring men had roped turbans around their heads. The women wore rubber slippers. The high temperature had turned the ground into a thousand pieces of glass. Padma wandered off with her goats. It had been a good year for the mint harvest, and Sohan Lal had more than 30 kilograms of fragrant green leaves bundled up and ready to go. He would sell the oil to a wholesaler in the bazaar, and the men would sell it on to factories that made toothpaste, tobacco, medicines, and mouthwash. Sohan Lal's mint would travel from Katra village across towns and cities in India, and perhaps even go abroad. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it might on the surface look like, you know, it's an innocuous description, but actually it sort of brings the reader right into the, into the scene uh, of action. And it also shows how women are involved in, in labor at home and in the, and the agricultural economy. But I wanted to ask you, so, so it calls for a very uh, uh, fine uh, kind of reporting. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, you know, when you were talking to Sia Devi, for instance, who's Lali's mother, uh, you know, she, you're talking to someone who's lost her daughter and uh, it's hard enough to get her to talk about that. On top of which, how do you convince her of your project that you want to actually enliven these characters and the village you know she's she you know she's i've just lost my daughter why is she asking me about what i cooked in the morning you know what did i tell what i told padma over the wall so how did you kind of tease these details out of all these characters i think you make such a good point and it's it's one that hasn't come up in a lot of conversations which is that the families at the center of the book were recovering uh, from an enormous, unspeakable trauma. You know, anybody who has loved a child, whether as a parent or, or, or a relative, knows that to lose a child is, I mean, there's nothing worse. Um, and, and then, you know, in, in this particular case, the parents didn't just have to come to terms with the fact that they had lost their most beloved um, of, of I don't know, you can't call a child a possession, but the most beloved thing in the world. But uh, they also had to, you know, interact with the media because they had to make sure that the story remained in the news because to, uh, they wanted to fulfill their ultimate purpose, which was justice. So they had to engage with the media, with politicians. It was a circus, you know, they were like in a reality show. Um, and then, and, and, and then, then I show up a year later offering really n nothing because a year later, you know, the investigations have completed and here I am again, um, a stranger asking the same questions. So I do have a tremendous amount of sympathy and, and as a reporter, it's really hard not to feel just an excruciating sense of unbelonging. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, you, you do feel uh, really not very happy with yourself for having to do this. And what what works is um, is is to just give yourself a lot of time and just say it probably I won't know in a year or two or three, but hopefully sometime after that. But to just not put a limit on time. Um, and, and perhaps not even ask too many questions. Uh, be ready not to uh, be, be ready for people to repeat the same things that they have been saying uh, without nuance for the completely understandable reason that they have been repeating the same thing because they've been asked the same questions. So I think you have to keep your expectations low, um, be very patient, be very kind. Um, and also be ready to walk away from the story. This is a very hard thing for a reporter to do, but you have to be ready because you are dealing with people who have been severely traumatized. Um, and, and so, you know, your expectations have to be low in, in, in very short. So another thing that works when, say, you're dealing with somebody like, uh, as you point out, Sia Devi, uh, is to widen 
the the scope of the people that you would interview because you know it seems like a very small number of people were involved with the events leading up to the death of the children when in fact a large number of people were present that joint family itself consists of about 18 people and then consider the people who were involved in the first search party and the second and so on and so forth so you don't have to put all your sort of Right. So you were saying how you you interviewed, you know, a whole lot of people. It wasn't just, you know, the small cast of characters related directly to the incident. Yes. 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 Of course, that's the deep reporting that's required to produce this kind of uh, a book. Um, so, yeah. So you describe actually Katra. You also describe Jati. So Katra is a village where uh, dominated by the lower caste Shakyas and Jati has the Yadavs and you also kind of uh, have done a lot of work around that police station and the relationships between the policemen but in all this this whole society that you uh, sort of recreate uh, you know the roles are very sharply defined it's a caste-based society it's very patriarchal oppressively patriarchal and of course in the, such a society women have the least autonomy of all and yeah. you suggest that they know it so there's an extraordinary passage that you write uh, in which you describe the villagers um, sitting around the tree when, uh, you know, watching, keeping watch over the bodies that are hanging of these two young girls. And you write, women sat cross-legged on the bare ground with their faces covered to ensure modesty. And then you further write, when they cannot control us, they kill us, they agreed. So these are the women talking about the men. So how did you did the women tell you this how did you get a sense of what they felt i mean and is resentment and anger at the system sort of bubbling under the surface so uh, again you know it, it the the events give you a sense an initial sense that a small group of people were involved but actually there were so many and so when the children's bodies are discovered in the scene that you mentioned uh, you know all the women surge forward to protect Padman Lali's mothers to support them and to support Padman Lali's grandmother and then because there is such a sort of division between And it becomes like a fortress of women protecting the children and making a decision amongst themselves that until the police don't take the case seriously, they will not allow them to take down the bodies. And that was a decision that came from them. And it is, you would think it, 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 it sort of is a logical decision given how, you know, justice plays out or doesn't play out in certain parts of India. But actually, it is an incredibly important one because this is a village, not unlike many others, in which women don't speak 
in front of men. Women don't eat before men. Women sit lower than men. So a man uh, and a woman will never sit on a chart boy together. You know, a woman will be on the floor. A man will be on the chart boy. And they don't have decision making powers that even extend to their domain, which would be the kitchen. They don't get to shop for the food. They don't even get to shop for their own clothes. So then to see women who have been forced into that position then to make this decision that would change everything and put them in a position of power is really significant and really very moving and i think that it shows you how strong they are you know i mean you would have to be strong right Shimon, if you're really living in this kind of society where you do so much work for no credit and you carry so many burdens and you're constantly being harassed and victimized uh, you may be happy, you may have a life full of love, but you're never permitted to be who you want to be, to be your fullest or your best self. And yet these women, they sort of, they, ha they haven't forgotten who they are. You know, I mean, for generations, men have been trying to tell women that you can't be anything that I don't want you to be. But these women, despite that indoctrination, didn't forget who they are and what they're capable of. And they showed it on the day the children's bodies were found. Right. And, and talking about self-expression, your book is as much about sexual violence as it is about adolescent sexuality. And, uh, you know, youngsters in this book, sort of they are very aware of the costs of transgression, but they are constantly pushing the boundaries. Is that something to celebrate? I mean, is that like kind of a sort of chink of hope? I mean, you know, one of the things that we forget when we talk about situations like this involving young people is that, you know, young people all over the world, no matter what their circumstances are, are going to do what young people do. I mean, have we, I mean, I'm old, but I've not forgotten what it's like to be, to have been 13 and 14, you know, you, 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 you chat with boys and you, you want to have a boyfriend and you, we, we made the crank calls, we did all of that stuff. So why wouldn't kids, even in a place like Katra, and I say even because, you know, we have other places like Katra and, and we think that, oh my gosh, everything is completely different, but actually kids are the same everywhere. And what was, in a way, so, gosh, it seems like a strange word to use, but delightful, you know, was to know that Padma and Lali were just kids. And that is delightful and that's tragic because it's delightful because they were just kids doing what kids their age, girls their age do, which is they, you know, wanted to, they were curious about the opposite sex. And who isn't? And it's tragic because that's all there was. You know, and there's such a heavy price to pay for just being who you are, for being, not just being who you are, but just acting your age. You know, they were acting their age and they paid a horrible horrible price for that but hidden in all of these things when we talk about caste and police and justice and politics we sometimes forget that the people at the center of it they were just going about their lives and of course they knew the price they were paying but the fact is that a lot of people their age understand that there is a cost to bear and this is not just about being a, a villager in Katra in a lot of places in India irrespective of class or caste you know there are very strict rules about engaging with the opposite sex and everybody is aware of these rules these rules are different they may be you know more strict or less depending on your family but they exist and most people flout them and so I would not be surprised if Padman Lali knew that there were a lot of young women and young men who were flouting the rules and who accepted that this is what life is. But, you know, it just took a very, very dark turn for them. Right. And, and one of the uh, channels through which they actually got to uh, view the outside world was the mobile phone. And in the beginning, you describe how... Uh, one of the villagers, Rajiv Kumar, was actually, you know, planning to complain to their parents that they were using mobile phones in public. And right at the end, there is a woman who's married into the family, Lalita, 
who uh, says, you know, if they weren't using mobile phones, they wouldn't have put themselves in danger. And, you know, it's all their parents' fault. You know, they allowed them to use mobile phones. Could you briefly talk about, uh, you know, the role of the mobile phone? And then we'll move on to question and answers. Yeah, 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 of course. So, you know, Katra, like everywhere in India, is awash with mobile phones. There were about five mobile phones just in the Shakya family. And Padma had been given a mobile phone of her own, but she and Lali had access to all the others as well. And they used the phones to text and to make calls. And there was nothing unusual about this in Katra. Uh, certainly not the family that in its own way was quite forward thinking. You know, they sent both the girls to a, to a private school where they were learning English and math and science. And so this was a family that didn't think there's anything uh, odd or, or um, uh, uh, yeah, just, just strange about young women using phones. But there were people in the village who didn't agree. And one of these people was Rajiv Kumar, who really took great offense when he saw the girls talking on the mobile phone. And it's very possible that the combination of the fact that they were talking on the phone, that they were doing it in a somewhat isolated part of the village away from their family, perhaps it was the manner of the girls, whatever it was, he came to the, seemed to come to the conclusion that they were talking to a boy. And again, this is not a man who knows Padma Lali or even their family, but there was an idea in the village that a girl's life is everyone's business. And if you see a girl doing something that she shouldn't, then you need to complain. And Rajiv Kumar is the person who, in fact, triggered the series of events that led to their death. Um, I mean, I don't think he would accept that. I think he would say he was just doing what any quote unquote decent person was doing. But in fact, after the children died, the family you know, searching for answers for what might have happened, couldn't bring themselves to recognize the role they and the society they lived in had played in contributing to the death. So they chose to blame something that had nothing to do with the matter. It's a bit like saying, you know, um, if, 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 if the, the houses weren't placed in so-and-so manner, then the children might not have met the boy. But that, that's got nothing to do with it. You know, I mean, girls will meet boys and vice versa and, and phones and TVs will exist. That they are not doing the killing objects, don't do the killing. It's how people perceive those objects that end up in, in, in terrible tragedy. So that is exactly what happened. I mean, nobody knows how to say, you know, I, I contributed. I might have done something differently. And I do understand that because what family member can accept their role in the death of somebody they loved? Um, so, yes, it, it came down to if they had not been phones, then our children would have been alive today. That, that's, that's, that's correct. Right. And, and the book really sort of, uh, you know, brings in all those ambivalences very beautifully. So now we have a question. Uh, this is a question from... Usha Subramaniam, drawing from your own experience, what is the role of imagination in a work of literary nonfiction? And there's none. Um, I, I just don't know how you would justify imagination in, uh, in nonfiction. It's, um, it, it's, it's just not something that you can use because uh, you are telling a true story about real people, many of whom continue to be alive. Uh, I mean, that's, that's actually irrelevant whether they're alive or, or, or dead. But if you're telling a true story, then you need to stick with facts. And you may think, well, you know, how do I find out certain details like the temperature or the color of the sky or, or, or whether or not there was a full moon? And what you forget is that there are endless numbers of people who you can talk to, who can speak to you in a way that is very precise, as long as you understand how to get them to think like that. So for example, if you ask somebody, um, what was it like that night, that person is not going to immediately come out and say to you, it was a cloudless sky 
and the only sounds were that of barking dogs. Nobody thinks like that. But if you listen to what they have to say, and then you gently say, you know, was it a full moon? Uh, did you hear any sounds? Uh, did you hear the sounds of the animals? Did you hear footsteps? Was it warm or was it cold? And then you're going to get the sort of details that animate a book like this. And so you're not put into that position of saying, oh my gosh, I don't have the details that will bring the story to life. You will always have them as long as you give yourself time and you ask the right questions. Right. And so we have one time for one final question from Sagarika Bide, who asks, uh, you know, how long did you take to do this book? And did you kind of live in that village or in the in that vicinity? I started reporting on the book um, in actually reporting on it in 2015 and uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 2018 was the last time I went there. Um, so I did four years of reporting um, in Katra, Sadat Ganj, but I didn't live there. I was, uh, I, I live in London and I was in London at the time. So I would fly to Delhi and then I would take a, uh, uh, I would take a car to Bareilly, uh, spend the night in Bareilly <clears throat> and the next morning drive another two and a half hours to go to Katra, Sadat Ganj. And I would do about several trips a year of about one or two weeks, you know, depending on, on what. Uh, and b because many people involved in the story, such as the police officers, had been transferred out of Badayu, I also traveled around Uttar Pradesh to, to track them down and, and um, yeah, and, and to interview them. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so did you find that being in London uh, gave you a little bit of distance? Like each time you went in and came came out do you think that was a worked as an uh, work to your advantage in the end the fact that you constantly could move away from the scene and view it from a distance yeah i mean that was that was actually something that was um that was significant i think in terms of helping the book um and i never experienced that before because when i wrote beautiful thing i was living in bombay and i felt that i was living in the dance bars because i was going there every single day I don't think that's good for creating that sense of distance and objectivity. I don't think that's good for a reporter's mental health, which you really have to look after. Um, I don't think that's that's good in general. I would not repeat that experience of being so immersed in a, in a story. So yes, to answer your question, it was very helpful to be separate and then to be, you know, like, and feel like an active participant at times. Excellent. I mean, I could go on and on talking to Sonia because this book is so rich and I will end the session by urging readers once again to get a copy. It's just a fabulous um, work. And um, yeah, I thank all viewers who've joined us today and I thank Sonia for writing this very important book and for, you know, joining us on this session. Shimona, thank you so much for your time and thank you to um, the festival organizers and everyone who's watching. Thank you so much, Sonia and Sumana, for this discussion. Thank you to our audience for joining us for the Literature of Reality at Tata Literature Live 2021, the Mumbai International Lit Fest, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects and powered by Godrej. You can purchase Sonia Falero's The Good Girls and Ordinary Killing, as well as Beautiful Thing, which are available with our knowledge partners at landmarkexcite.com. Thank you.